Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the second section for the seventh module of the History of Christianity II course. In the previous modules, we looked at some developments on continental Europe in the generations after the Reformation. And now in this section, we're back to England to look at some later developments in the English church after the Reformation there, and after the Puritans and all the English history we've already covered. In this section, we're looking at the British Evangelical Revival and all its results. The British Evangelical Revival is actually one half of a revival that was happening on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, involving some of the same leaders and experiences. In the next section, we'll concentrate on what was happening in the colonies in North America at the same time, but in this section, we will just look at what happened in England and Wales. But keep in mind that the two sections are covering the same general work of God that affected these two different places, and more. And let's start with the timeline, so that you can see the relation of these things to the things we've already covered. John Wesley lived from 1703 to 1791. Charles Wesley lived from 1707 to 1788. George Whitfield was 1714 through 1770. And Howell Harris lived from 1714 through 1773. Charles Wesley founded the Holy Club at Oxford in 1729. Howell Harris was converted and began to preach in Wales in 1735. George Whitfield began preaching in 1737. John Wesley was converted in 1738, and he began preaching in 1739. And revival happened fairly consistently in Wales and then in England, starting in the late 1730s and with its effects lasting until the end of the century. Now, let's look in more detail about what happened in these places under the leadership of these men. And we'll start with the background, context, and causes. At that time, England was experiencing a low point on the spiritual roller coaster. Those were dry times. The influence of the faithful Puritans had declined because they'd been excluded from the official churches, and high church formalism with its shallowness and relative deadness, was the norm. The Anglican Church had become consistently shifting toward a liberal, apathetic, traditional formalism without heart. And yet, the Anglican Church controlled the official churches under the parish system. The churches preached bland morality and philosophy instead of preaching Christ. For example, Sir William Blackstone wrote about his visits to many churches in London at the time, and he said that in most sermons, it was impossible to tell if the preacher was a follower of Confucius, Muhammad, or Christ. The nonconformists, that is, the remnants of the Puritans, they were praying for revival. Some were solid, but they were a smaller and smaller influence. And there was a fear of what they called enthusiasm, by which they meant fanaticism. There had been many people who were fanatics, who typically went in a heretical direction claiming to be prophets, but spewing nonsense. And the church was right to be wary of such things. Now, to be fair, there were also enthusiastic people who were genuinely on fire for Christ, but because of the bad actors, people became highly suspicious of anyone who was overly passionate about their religion. And this was also the time of industrialization, where people were leaving rural farms and packing into urban slums for factory jobs, which brought about the typical problems of the urban poor. There were lax morals with high rates of alcoholism, prostitution, gambling, and child abuse and abandonment, among other problems. And therefore, much of England slid into a culture of merely intellectual faith. Of course, the life of the mind is good and important, but like Protestant scholasticism, in England, this often became imbalanced by lacking other areas of Christian life. They believed things about God, but did not seem to care enough about them for it to make a difference in their lives. They lacked a volitional whole life belief. The churches sometimes changed people's minds so that they would say they're Christian, but did not often see changed lives. They were what we would call nominal Christians, that is, Christians in name but not in conviction and lifestyle. Does that sound familiar for churches that you've seen today? And yet, 
in the 1730s, something began to change. And there were a few causes that we can see behind the changes that happened in this portion of history. First was a rediscovery of Puritan and Reformed writings. There are significant testimonies from leaders of the evangelical revival that they read the Puritans and Protestant reformers, which led to their own awakening and motivation. They learned theology and history and saw the urgency and opportunity of their own situation. And there was some smaller lingering influence of those churches still trying to be faithful to the principles and practices of earlier, stronger times. And there was also the influence of pietist practice and ideals, which we examined in the previous section. The Moravians were especially influential on the Wesley brothers. But finally, the evangelical revival was God's sovereign work of giving new life to his church. God, in his infinite wisdom and grace, decided to stir up life in his church in England at that time and in that way. The evangelical revival was a genuine revival where God worked in extraordinary ways. Some have compared it to popcorn because revival popped up in one place and then in a different place, seemingly unrelated, but all because of the same underlying cause. In other words, the evangelical revival was not as much like a family tree where we can trace one direct influence causing another, but rather it was more like God working through different people in different places all at the same time. Like I mentioned earlier, this was happening in North America at the same time it was happening in England. There was some influence and inspiration and cooperation, but there were largely independent movements. It happened among different people and different places. It happened in different cities in England, Wales, Scotland, and the American colonies. It was not caused by the official church, which was fairly dead at that time. But it did happen among the fringes of the official church, more than in the nonconformist churches. Some, but not all, of the leaders were Anglican clergy, primarily working among Anglican churches. But most of the Anglican leadership did not like them and resisted their work, and they often acted as parachurch, functionally different from the official church, though technically still a part of it. The evangelical revival mostly impacted the poor, disestablished people that the official Anglican church largely ignored. So there was some continuity with the English Reformation, established Church of England, and the Puritans, but there was also discontinuity. Some establishment leaders led it, but largely outside of the establishment among the common people. Now, the first notable event happened in Wales, under the leadership of a man named Howell Harris. He was converted in 1735, partly through just a normal sermon about preparing for communion. Because of that sermon, Harris wrestled within himself about the state of his own soul, and he also read a Puritan book called The Whole Duty of Man. And through those, he came to full conviction of belief in Christ and assurance that he was actually saved. Harris started preaching almost immediately after his conversion, starting with his family and neighbors. In his diary, he wrote that he had some insatiable desires after the salvation of poor sinners. My heart longed for their being convinced of their sins and misery. And Harris was actually never officially ordained, but he preached throughout Wales, in churches, and out in public. He often preached five sermons a day, and thousands were converted through his ministry. Someone wrote about Harris. He found Wales slumbering. He left it awake. And Harris was also a direct inspiration to George Whitfield, who we'll examine in a minute. And there were other leaders, such as Daniel Rowland and William Williams and others in Wales, who also contributed to the revival in similar manners. But next, we'll look at the Holy Club, which was started by Charles Wesley. This was a group of friends at Oxford University. They were serious about religion and wanted to encourage one another at a time when Christianity was not taken seriously at Oxford. They vowed to lead holy lives. They took communion once a week. They prayed daily. They visited prisons regularly. And they spent three hours each afternoon studying the Bible and devotional literature. 
They were very methodical about their spiritual pursuits. And so they were given the mocking nickname of Methodists. They had the attitude that they were working out their salvation. But they had a borderline works legalism mentality. And some of the leaders we'll talk about would testify of their later conversion experience after they had already been practicing the Holy Club disciplines. In some ways, they were similar to Martin Luther in that they were trying to be good Christians and earn their faith by good works. And then later, they pleasantly discovered justification by grace through faith and were genuinely converted. We will concentrate on three members of the Holy Club who became leaders in the evangelical revival. One of the members of the Holy Club was named George Whitfield. His father died when he was two years old, and so he grew up relatively poor, and yet he was a good student. Whitfield was converted through a prolonged wrestling and trying to justify himself through good works until Christ broke through and he genuinely believed in God's gracious salvation through the sacrifice of Christ. He was able to study at Oxford under a work-study program. He basically worked as a servant to the rich students, and he was part of the Holy Club with the Wesley brothers and others. Whitfield was eventually ordained as an Anglican priest, and he preached in churches. But he also began preaching outdoors to anyone who would listen following the example of Howell Harris. He averaged around 10 sermons per week for most of his adult life. He was especially effective around the city of Bristol, which was a poor industrial area. There are stories of coal miners hearing Whitfield preach while they were still covered with coal dust after their shift. And he recounted one example of this kind of thing when he wrote, having no righteousness of their own to renounce, they were glad to hear of a Jesus who was a friend of publicans and came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The first discovery of their being affected was to see the white gutters made by their tears which plentifully fell down their black cheeks as they came out of the coal pits. Hundreds and hundreds of them were soon brought under deep convictions, which, as the event proved, happily ended in a sound and thorough conversion. The change was visible to all. Now, Whitfield was a blunt and forceful preacher, and self-proclaimed respectable people were sometimes offended by his forthrightness, especially when he talked about sin. So, Whitfield was often opposed and met with controversy. Many churches would not let him preach in their pulpit, and so he continued to preach in the open air. Remember that many of the established churches of that time were dead, and he regularly preached a sermon he called the Almost Christian, based on Acts 26, 28. He warned against being a Christian in name only, without a genuine change of life, what he called being an almost Christian. Let me quote a few lines from that sermon. He said, I cannot but think it highly necessary to warn my dear hearers of the dangers of such a state, and therefore, from the words of the text, shall endeavor to show these three things. First, what is meant by an almost Christian? Secondly, what are the chief reasons why so many are no more than almost Christians? Thirdly, I shall consider the ineffectualness, danger, absurdity, and uneasiness which attends those who are but almost Christian, and then conclude with a general exhortation to set all upon striving not only to be almost, but altogether Christians. And he goes on, an almost Christian, if we consider him in respect to his duty to God, is one that halts between two opinions, that wavers between Christ and the world, that would reconcile God and mammon, light and darkness, Christ and Belial. It is true he has an inclination to religion, but then he is very cautious how he goes too far in it. His false heart is always crying out, spare yourself, do yourself no harm. And the first proof I shall give of the folly of such a proceeding is that it is ineffectual to salvation. It is true, such men are almost good, but almost to hit the mark is really to miss it. Persons may play the hypocrite, but God at the great day will strike them dead, 
as he did Ananias and Sapphira by the mouth of his servant Peter, for pretending to offer him all their hearts when they keep back from him the greatest part. Let me therefore, to conclude, exhort you, my brethren, to have always before you the unspeakable happiness of enjoying God, and think that every degree of holiness you neglect, every act of piety you omit, is a jewel taken out of your crown, a degree of blessedness lost in the vision of God. Now, Whitfield was a very dramatic, engaging preacher and a great storyteller. He preached to huge crowds in the days before microphones, but he had a huge, deep voice that resonated over large distances. Benjamin Franklin estimated that he could be heard by about 30,000 people at a time without amplification. And Whitfield's sermons were often accompanied by emotional outbursts from the people who heard about Jesus and were overcome with grief and then hope about the state of their souls. The bottom line is that George Whitfield was a very effective evangelist, and thousands were converted to Christ through his preaching. Now, we'll see more of Whitfield in the next section, because he also regularly traveled to North America to preach there. But we'll move on to Charles Wesley, who was the founder of the Holy Club. He was the younger brother of the more famous John Wesley, who we'll examine in a minute. Both were raised in a godly home, and their parents are worthy of study if we had more time. Now, even though his brother John went on to more notoriety, Charles played a key part in influencing the salvation of his brother John and of other leaders of the British Revival. Charles was also a preacher and evangelist. He contributed to the revival on his own, but he's best known as a hymn writer. He wrote somewhere between six and 9,000 hymns, many of which are still sung today, including Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, and Jesus, Lover of My Soul. And if you don't mind, I'll refrain from listing the other 6,000. And Charles Wesley assisted the ministry of his older brother, John. And that brings us to his older brother, John Wesley. John was also educated at Oxford and was part of the Holy Club, and he became an Anglican priest. He and Charles traveled to the colony of Georgia in North America to become missionaries. And on that trip, he met with some Moravians who were sent out from Herrenhut, as we learned about in the last section. John Wesley technically was the chaplain of the ship on the voyage to Georgia, but in the midst of a harsh storm, the Moravians actually comforted and ministered to him. One of the Moravians actually confronted Wesley. As Wesley told the story in his own words, the Moravian said, My brother, I must first ask you one or two questions. Have you the witness within yourself? Does the Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? I was surprised and knew not what to answer, Wesley said. He observed it and asked, Do you know Jesus Christ? I paused and said, I know he is the Savior of the world. True, he replied. But do you know that he has saved you? I answered, I hope he has died to save me. He only added, Do you know yourself? I said, I do, but I fear they were vain words. In other words, John Wesley testified that at that time he did not know whether he was genuinely saved, even though he was already an Anglican priest traveling to do missionary work. And his ministry in Georgia was pretty much a failure, and he returned to England. He wrote, I went to the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? And then back in London, three days after his brother Charles was converted, John did have a conversion experience, which he later narrated in this way. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me 
that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And from that point, Wesley reluctantly followed Whitfield's example of preaching outdoors to the lower classes. At first, he thought it was only proper to preach in church with the proper Anglican liturgy, but Whitfield convinced him to go where the people were. Again, in Wesley's own words, he wrote, At four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining to the city, to about 3,000 people. The scripture on which I spoke was this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And for the rest of his life, Wesley was a circuit-riding preacher. That means he traveled from place to place on horseback to preach all around. He once said, I look upon all the world as my parish. And it's estimated that he traveled around 5,000 miles a year. Now, Wesley had a smart, well-trained horse, so he would just let go of the reins and let the horse go until it needed direction. And so Wesley would spend his traveling time reading on horseback instead of steering the horse. Now, please don't try that if you're driving. My point is that Wesley was a voracious reader. He was knowledgeable on many subjects, which came out in his preaching. And yet, he also claimed that he aspired to be a man of one book, that is, the Bible. And just like Whitfield, in his preaching, he regularly called people from nominal Christianity to true conversion. Wesley also preached a sermon titled The Almost Christian for that purpose. Wesley's preaching, like Whitfield's, had a fairly standard approach because they both learned it from the Puritans. Wesley said that he preached the law and the dangerous state of sinners until he saw evidence that God's Spirit was moving the hearts of his hearers with the conviction of the truth of their need. Then he would preach the grace of God and the cross of Christ as the solution to their need. He said also he would go back and remind them of the law and their need so that they would not presume on the grace of God, and so they would see how wonderful that grace actually is. But then he would fully emphasize the grace and salvation of Christ and urge his hearers to trust completely on him and his righteousness and not to trust in their own works or righteousness. And like Whitfield and his brother Charles, John Wesley also experienced much opposition, including from the established church. That included exclusion from the churches and verbal abuse, but also physical violence. And John Wesley was also a writer, and he's known for believing and teaching a few particular doctrines. He talked about what has been called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, though this did not originate with Wesley, nor was he the only one to use it. This is basically a discussion of his underlying authority for knowledge. Wesley taught that he learned from and trusted scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. Now, he insisted that scripture was a greater authority than the other three, but he elevated the other three higher than many others at that time and before in the Reformation did. And there's still debate whether he compromised the primary functional authority of Scripture by teaching the quadrilateral. Wesley also taught Arminianism. Some claim that he was a confused Calvinist because of his actions and some of the ways that he preached, but he clearly rejected the idea of predestination. And that actually went against Article 17 of the Anglican 39 Articles that Wesley had promised to uphold as part of his ordination. And Wesley disputed with Whitfield about that subject, because Wesley was an Arminian and Whitfield was a Calvinist. And that led to a complete separation of their ministries and even a temporary breach in their friendship in 1741. They did reconcile as friends, but they never worked together again in ministry. And Wesley taught what he called prevenient grace. 
This was an attempt to answer some arguments against Arminianism. He agreed that all people were caught in sin and unable to believe in Christ on their own, but, Wesley taught, God gives grace to all people indiscriminately before their conversion, which allows and enables them to freely believe. But he taught that this grace is not determinative. It does not give salvation or cause salvation. It only enables people to believe and therefore be saved. And Wesley also taught what he called entire sanctification. This is the idea that a Christian can reach the level of completion in their holiness in this lifetime, that a person can attain a state of complete sanctification. And this, Wesley taught, could happen in a second experience, similar to a new conversion, a second blessing. Now, Wesley was a little ambiguous about this and sometimes denied the idea that we could reach sinless perfection in this life, but others after him pushed that idea further than Wesley did. Now, all of these men we have surveyed contributed in some way to what became known as Methodism. Methodism demonstrates one of the greatest differences in approach between Whitfield and Wesley. You see, Whitfield was an evangelist. He preached for conversion, and then he trusted the local parish churches to disciple the new converts. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people are called to concentrate primarily on evangelism, as long as the local churches could be trusted to follow up. Wesley also preached for conversion, but in addition to that, he organized people and structures to care for and disciple the converts. He developed an organization to follow up and oversee the people apart from the parish churches. They were organized into small groups, which were organized into larger bands, and then classes, and that was for mutual support and accountability. And these groups were led by lay preachers and leaders parallel to the already existing Anglican church structure. These groups taught Christian faith and practice. And they sang hymns in order for people to learn and retain theology. Methodist groups were known for their music. Much of it was written by Charles Wesley. It is argued that Charles had more long-lasting impact by his hymns than John did by his preaching. They taught people through the lyrics of the songs that they sang. And the Methodist groups were fairly strict in accountability and structure. John Wesley got a reputation for being a bit controlling, and some gave him the nickname Pope John. But this organization and structure, it did help the longevity of this revival and the more thorough discipleship and catechism of the new converts. Some have argued that the majority of the people in the Methodist groups were actually converted under the preaching of Whitfield, but came under the influence of Wesley because of his follow up organization. The Methodists intended to be a supplement to the official Anglican churches, not a new denomination. And the Wesley brothers and Whitfield, they remained ordained Anglicans until their death. All right, now let's look at the results and significance of all these people and events. Like I mentioned, there was a genuine revival of strength, health, and growth in the English church during that time and for a while afterward. It was a great time of renewed spirituality in Christian life. Whitfield and others evangelized and saw many conversions. Wesley and others brought them into organized societies and discipled them. There was a renewed structure alongside the official church for follow-up and accountability. And then, after the death of John Wesley, the Methodists formally separated from the Anglican Church to form the Methodist Church. But in fact, they were functioning practically as a separate organization before Wesley's death. Though the Wesley brothers, again, they wanted to remain faithful Anglicans. Now, one of the strengths of this revival movement is that it did not wait for the people to come into the official churches, but it went out to meet the needy people where they were at. And then it brought them back into stable structures for their growth among other faithful people also trying to live out that new life. 
They combined theology, passion, worship, and good works. But ultimately, it was a work of God to revive his stagnant church. And there was a ton of social action and social change that came out of this movement. They printed Bibles and tracts. They raised up and sent missionaries. They cared for the poor and influenced better labor laws. They worked for humane prison reform. They built hospitals and schools. They instituted Sunday schools. And at that time, Sunday school was not just for teaching children about Jesus as a sidelight to the main church service, but it was a time to teach children and adults to read and do math and other such life skills, in addition to teaching them about Christ. It was like a regular school connected to a church, but done when people had a day off from work. In other words, the church educated people who had no other opportunities for education in order to improve their lot in life. And they worked to free people from the vices of alcoholism and gambling. And ultimately, flowing out of this movement was the abolishment of slavery and the slave trade in England and all of Great Britain and their territories. Wesley encouraged William Wilberforce, who, along with others like John Newton, were very instrumental in eventually convincing Britain to turn away from slavery. And the British Empire was instrumental in abolishing slavery and the slave trade in most parts of the world. And this all came out of the influence of the evangelical revival. They intentionally worked toward the ideal of a Christian society. Now, England was already officially Christian in name, but had neglected faithful Christian life in the decades before this revival. So they worked so that Britain would return to also be Christian in practice and not just in name and in every part of life. Now, in contrast to the multitude of failed attempts for social change in our time, it actually worked in that time to address and solve various social problems because it was done by biblical principles as an outflow of Christian life, character, and power. When we involve God's Spirit and we're obedient to His Word, things just work and change for the better. But when we try to change things, divorced from God's Word and His wisdom, it doesn't work. When we try to solve these kinds of problems by human wisdom, we usually make them worse. But at that time, in Britain, we see a shining example of real solutions to social problems, because they were addressed from a Christian worldview and with the power of the gospel to change lives, not just the impotence of governments changing rules or throwing money at the problem. Now, on a related note, just a few decades after this, there would be a bloody revolution in France, and many historians point out that England avoided a similar fate only because of this revival and the genuine Christian influence that came out of it. So now, let's review. Concerning the British Evangelical Revival, the Holy Club was a group of college students pursuing God. This included George Whitfield, John, and Charles Wesley. The Evangelical Revival was a genuine revival that started in Wales under Howell Harris, and it spread to England and the New World. It was characterized by outdoor preaching to the lower classes. It was mostly outside of the established church's control, while still connected with them. The Methodists organized the converts. They met in small groups, and they learned theology by singing hymns, and they all worked to change society for Christ. And that brings us to some discussion and application questions. First, what about the lives of Howell Harris, George Whitfield, John Wesley, and or Charles Wesley stood out to you, and why? Describe what they did and why they were so influential. And what insights, positive and or negative, can you learn from their lives and ministries? And how can you apply these things in your own life and ministry? Second is a similar but more broad question. What can we learn from the British evangelical revival? What happened and why is that significant? 
How is it related to the historical state of the church before the revival? What is the connection between cause and effect in what happened? What did they do that was good? Why was it good and fruitful? What could they have done better? How is our current historical situation similar or different from that time? How can you apply what you learned from this revival to your own time and situation? And how specifically do you plan to put these insights into practice? Finally, is the open ended question What else did you learn? And how does it apply in your situation? All right, now's the time to pause the video for discussion. When you're ready, restart the video for some guiding principles, and I'll see you then. All right, welcome back. Now let's explore a few guiding principles I think we can learn from the British Evangelical Revival. The first is that we should evangelize almost Christians. The word revival means to bring something back to life. Every historical revival has started by reviving the church, by waking up the half-hearted or nominal Christians and churches to the full reality and significance of Christ. Therefore, sometimes we need to proclaim the good news to those who are already cultural Christians, but who may not actually be born again. Preach the gospel to your own church. Preach the gospel to your own children. Preach the gospel to those who've heard it a million times before and think they know it all. Don't assume people are saved, but call them to salvation and the full life of Christ in every part of life. Just like judgment starts with the people of God, revival starts close to home. Therefore, we should all pray, let revival start in me and respond appropriately. And then pray, let revival start in my family, in my church, in my community, and respond accordingly. However, even if revival starts close to home, it should never end there. Start where you are and work outward from there. Therefore, the second principle is to evangelize where people are. Just like Whitfield and Wesley did not stay in the church building, but went out to the people and preached in the open air, we should go out and proclaim Christ in the marketplace and social meeting places, meet people wherever they're at, show them that they don't need to get cleaned up enough to go to a church building before they can believe in Christ. Rather, demonstrate that Christ comes to them no matter where they are. Don't wait for them to come to you, but go out to the highways and byways. Meet them where they are but also take them where they need to go from there. And that leads to the next principle. Evangelize and disciple people. Now, one person does not have to do it all. We all have different gifts, abilities, and callings. It is okay if Whitfield does the lion's share of the evangelism and Wesley does more of the discipleship, as long as the church as a whole assures that all of these things do happen. Jesus did not command his people only to make converts, even though that is an indispensable first step. He commanded us to make disciples, and this involves catechizing people and integrating them into a new community for mutual support and accountability. He told us to baptize them and teach them to obey all that he commanded. So, follow-up discipleship and training in the Christian worldview and lifestyle are just as important as evangelism, and neither should be neglected. And the next principle is, in evangelizing others, don't forget to evangelize yourself. Remember that some in the Holy Club were not yet genuinely born again at that time. They were trying to work for their salvation by doing good works and serving God. But they did not yet know God until they truly understood and embraced the free gift of salvation through Christ. So be careful. Don't just work for Christ, but trust him and know him. And preach the gospel to yourself to keep that in the forefront of your mind. And of course, that is related to the principle of the almost Christian. Don't just assume that everyone in your family or church 
is a genuine Christian, don't even presume on your own salvation without conclusive evidence. Do what you can to assure that this is actually the case. And one insight that we learned from the evangelical revival to help us disciple people is the principle of teaching theology through music. Paul wrote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And how did he say to do this? First, he said, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. But then he also wrote, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In other words, we teach and encourage one another in the normal ways that we consider teaching and training, but we also do it with the lyrics of our songs. God's Word can dwell in us through the words that we sing. And that means that we need to choose and sing songs that are theologically true and significant. There are so many songs to choose from today that we should not settle for singing trivial and lightweight songs, nor should we sing songs that are theologically untrue or even suspect. The things we sing are training our people about God and the Christian life. Therefore, sing significant songs. Sing songs about a great God who has done great things. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of what some people call Jesus is my boyfriend songs. You know, the kind of songs that if you took out the name Jesus and substituted the word baby, it would fit in very nicely as a sappy love song that you hear on the radio. That is, songs that express vague emotions towards Jesus without talking about who he is and why he is worthy. The kind of songs that lower Jesus to our level and tame him to only being about our petty concerns, instead of raising our hearts beyond ourselves towards his level, towards the transcendence of our Creator, Savior, and Lord, and his eternal purposes. We can do better than that. If sappy emotionalism is all we offer people, if that's all we teach people about Jesus in our songs, then it's no wonder that many North American churches are weak and biblically illiterate. If all we proclaim in our songs is some psychological comfort, then what are we offering people that they don't already get from Hollywood? Now, please forgive me for putting this so bluntly, but if in our worship we only proclaim that Jesus makes me feel good, then we're proclaiming to the world that he's no better than cocaine or masturbation, and that is blasphemy. Rather, I suggest that we sing songs that magnify Christ and teach people who he is and all he has done, and train people to respond appropriately to his greatness. We are discipling people with our worship music. The only question is whether we are discipling them towards health and depth or towards shallowness. We are teaching people theology through our songs, so make sure to teach them good and profitable theology. And then the final principle I want to suggest is that we should be faithful and extraordinary in whatever we do. In the History of Christianity 1 course, I described some early church leaders as doing ordinary things in extraordinary ways. And the same thing could accurately be said about Hal Harris, George Whitfield, and the Wesley brothers. They just preached Christ and discipled people the same things that every Anglican priest was supposed to be doing, and yet they did it way above and beyond the call of duty. They did it very well and diligently, and sometimes in creative, out-of-the-box ways. And God did the rest. And we can learn from their example and do the same. Now, you may be a preacher or evangelist like them, or you may not be. But like Paul wrote, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Don't give God your second best. We might be doing ordinary things seemingly, but we should do them in extraordinary ways with all of our heart, and we can trust God to do the rest. All right, that's all we can cover in this section. As always, there is more to explore if you'd like to go on in more depth, but I hope you now have a taste for what happened in this portion of history, and I pray that you've caught a vision of the kind of things that God can do 
even in your own situation. And I pray that he empower you to make a difference, that you would pray and work toward revival in your own life and in your own church and in your own city. In the next section, we'll cover basically the same revival we studied in this section, but we'll look at what God did on the other side of the ocean in the American colonies. And I hope you join us for that. Thanks for watching.